We want to say greetings to everyone and thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Brother Hawk Bolden and as usual, um, we're glad to bring you the things that the Lord have laid on our hearts to share with you all today. And we pray that uh, something will be said that will bless you and that will help you. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, let's go to the um, fact, let's go to the 33rd chapter of the book of Ezekiel. the 33rd chapter of the book of Ezekiel and it, let's, we're going to start reading at verse 1 and it reads again the word of the Lord came unto me saying son of man speak to the children of thy people and say unto them when I bring the sword upon a land if the people of the land take a man of their coasts and set him for their watchman. If when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people. Then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him, but he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. So, of course, now, if you can keep in mind that most of your big cities back then in the Bible days and in, in, in the land of Israel had walls around them for uh, security reasons. And what would happen is they, these walls were wide, pretty wide, sometimes 6 feet to 12 feet as far as, you know, uh, wide for you to be able to stand on top of them and you know in fact chariots could be up on these walls that sometimes you see so they were pretty wide and so what these people would do at a certain time of night they would lock all the doors into the city and they would set watchmen on the city and they would stand guard and they had a trumpet in their hand so that whenever they saw some kind of trouble coming uh, they felt like they were about to be breached uh, these watchmen would blow the trumpet and he would give a certain sound to let the city know, you know, to take cover or to prepare because we have an enemy coming or there's, these walls are about to be breached in some kind of way. And so what the Lord here is giving Ezekiel basically is telling him that when that watchman set, you know, set on that wall and he blows the trumpet, if the people don't give, take heed, then they, they'll basically they won't deliver themselves and their blood will be up on their own head and so you have to keep in mind that most of the time these people were sleeping when these people were inside of this wall or inside of their city at nighttime of course they were doing what most people do at night they sleep and so this this watchman or these watchmen were set all around the wall and they would blow a certain sound and it was number one to wake the people up and number two to let them know that danger was approaching and so they would wake up out of their sleep, try to hurry up and get whatever gear they had to get ready to go to war. And then, of course, they would set their families, their wives and children, you know, in a safe place and, you know, and, and things like that. So this is, the, this is the idea. You see that? This is the idea. Let's keep reading verse 6. It says, But if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. Now, this is saying that if the watchmen see trouble coming and they don't blow the trump trumpet, then that person that's inside of that city, they're basically now we're talking spiritually, so they'll lose their soul but the watchman is going to be in trouble for it. Now, the idea, you see, of this is the watchman being a person that can see danger coming. That's what he's, his job is. And many preachers today are not standing on that wall, and many of them are asleep themselves. 
they need to be woke up. Many preachers today, you see that? And so this, is, this was the commission that the Lord gave to me when I answered his call to preach, that I was a watchman and he would show me things, and it was my job to warn the people. And I think it's silly today that you have preachers who are against those watchmen who blow the trumpet. Apparently they are the sleep ones. Or maybe they're not even called to begin with. You see that. But it's the job of a watchman to, to blow the trumpet, to let God's people know when something is coming, when judgment is coming, and, and to warn people to turn away from their iniquities. Let's go ahead and keep reading verse 7. It says, So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. So you see, in the beginning, the Lord is talking about the people setting a watchman in the city. But here he's telling Ezekiel, who was a prophet and a priest, See, son of man, now I have set you a watchman. Let's go ahead and keep reading. O, unto the house of Israel, therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Now look, let's read that very carefully now. And let's look over that really, really carefully. He says, when I say unto the wicked, now let's back up to verse 7. He says, therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth, and warn them from me. So it's the prophet's job to hear the word of God from God's mouth. And warn the wicked. Why is it set that way? Because the wicked can't hear from God himself. They've gotten out of, way out of line. And so they can't hear from God themselves. Like, I mean, one on one. So God has to send a prophet, a mouthpiece to speak to them and to warn them. It's just like even David. David himself was a prophet. But when he got out of God's will, slept with Bathsheba, got Bathsheba pregnant, tried to deceive, you know, be deceptive with Bathsheba's husband, and his, uh, the husband didn't go for it, and then had the man killed, and then married Bathsheba, of course he had gotten out of the way. He wasn't hearing from God at all. And so then God had to send the prophet Nathan to a prophet to tell him. He had gotten out of God's will, and he was going to pay for it. Yeah, you're forgiven, but you're going to pay for it. You see that? You, it, it, you've set some stuff in, in motion. So it doesn't matter how long you think you've been serving the Lord, when you get out of God's will, you're no longer in a place to hear from God. And so then God has to send a prophet. A prophet, not a pastor. Pastors watch over the sheep. Prophets speak from the mouth of God directly. And sometimes those two people are, are one and the same, if that makes any sense. You see that? But God sends a prophet to those who have gotten out of the way who can't hear from God. That's what they're there for. And, and most of the time is with a message of correction, which is why it's hardly ever received. Because most people, you, you couldn't have told David. Now, he was a man after God's own heart. But you could not have told him that he had gotten out of the will of God. You, you know, if, if, if something happened to him, to cause him. Now, we're talking about David. He's still writing songs. He's still going to the worship place, but out of God's will and out of reach. And that's the way it is for people today. They think because they continue to go to church that they have continued in their relationship with the Lord and don't know that they have been cut off. The word of God tells us that God's hand is not shortened where it can't save, neither is his ear dull of hearing what he can't hear. But he says, your sins have separated between me and thee. Your sins have put a separation between us. And so let me make this clear to folks. If you are living in sin, you are a sinner. And you're not a sinner saved by grace. You are wicked. And if you are living in sin, 
you are not hearing from God directly. You are outside of the will of God. And whatever spirit that is that's speaking to you while you are living in sin, that is not the spirit of God. When you live in sin, God has to send his message to you through somebody who's in his will. God, if God was going to speak to every sinner, then there would be no need for prophets. No, no need for them at all. And so if you are a sinner, you are wicked. Now you, you better make that just soak in your mind. If you are sinning, you are wicked. It, there's no nice way to put it. Okay? So look at what he says in verse 8. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. Now I want you to notice how the Lord presents this. He's telling Ezekiel, when I tell you, or when you hear it come from my mouth. Now I want you to notice something. He says in verse 7, you shall hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. And so when God speaks a lot of times, he'll say, tell sister so-and-so, you know, or tell brother so-and-so, they're going to leave here doing what they're doing. And a lot of times he don't give this warning of turn from your wicked way. It's you about to, you go, you on your way to hell. Now people take that as, oh, you being judgmental. No, you're judging yourself is what it is. You know how crazy it is for you to go out and rob somebody and then go to court for it and then tell the judge, you, I feel like you judging me. Well, who's the reason you're standing before that judge? You've judged yourself. The Bible says don't judge. If a prophet speaks from the mouth of God, then who's the one that's really doing the judging? You see that? So the Lord says to tell them, you will surely die. In other words, tell them what the result of their sin is going to be. Now I'm going to tell you, if you're going to them with anything lighter than that, they don't know how to turn. It, because it's, it, they, they've heard the lie too much of we're all sinners saved by grace. So they have learned to excuse sin. Now I, I want you to notice when God warned Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis about eating of that tree. He told them in the day that you eat thereof you shall surely die. He didn't tell them what all was going to take place in between. He let them know what the end result was going to be. Why did he tell him that? Because he knew the devil wasn't going to tell him when the devil came to tempt him about it. And so when God, a lot of times, when he sends a prophet to warn people, it's to let them know what the end result is going to be. Repentance is up to them. God's not interested in telling them all the journey throughout, you know, and, and all of that stuff beforehand. Now, if you notice, when they did that, God then told them, now you're going to have to work at them. Eve, you're going to produce children, and it's going to grieve you to do that. You're going to be subject to your... And then he began to spell it out all out for them. But dying should have been the one that was going to turn them. If death didn't turn them, bearing children in sorrow wasn't going to turn them. And God knows that. God knows it. You see that? And so God, oftentimes, he gives people one in the same way that he did with Nineveh, that great city. He sent Jonah to tell him, in three days, this city is going to be destroyed. He didn't say anything. Jonah didn't say anything about, but if you repent, you know, maybe the Lord will help you. That was something that they came up with on their own. Now, let me explain why the Lord is saying this now. It is important for people to repent on their own. I have never led anybody in what they call the quote-unquote sinner's prayer. Because I wasn't sitting there with you when you sinned. I don't follow your life to know what results that sin have created in your life. Now, if you don't have enough sense to repent, how can I repent for you? 
That's your soul. I've already repented. You have to talk to God and tell God what you're repenting of. I don't know. I don't follow you. I don't know what all you've been doing. So I've never led anybody in the sinner's prayer. Repeat after me. Dear Lord, I'm going to say, no, I ain't going to do that. That's just as silly as me writing love letters for you to give to your girlfriend. Or for me to be there standing there and telling you what to say when you propose to her. If you're going to have a genuine relationship with the Lord, you need to learn how to talk to him. and You need to learn how to be in it, up front with him. You need to learn how to repent. Well, I'm telling you, repentance, that, that's a lost word today. That's a lost word. You see that? The church don't know anything about repentance. They just say, well, just give your heart to the Lord. But you know, before you do that, you have to repent. You have to have a godly sorrow for sin. A so-called Christian without, that don't have a disdain for sin is not a Christian at all. If you don't hate sin the way God hates it, you'll be right back in it. And, and you'll be separated from God for an eternity. You have to hate sin, which means you have to repent of sin. And repent, by the way, means to turn away from. Don't mean to, oh Lord, I'm a, I might keep doing this, I don't know. But right now, I'm sorry about it. If you keep doing it, then you have not truly repented from your heart. You might be sorry about doing it. You may be even sorrier that God knows that you're doing it. But true repentance takes place when you know in your heart that you need to turn away from it. If you really knew how sin have stung you and how that sin is going to take you to hell, you'd repent with no problem. That's the reason why, why hell need to be preached. That's the reason why God sends prophets to warn people where they're on their way to so that people will have a reason to repent. Because right now, the way these preachers got it set up, you don't have to repent for nothing. Just give, the, give your heart to the Lord and try to live the best way you know how. The Bible don't say that. The Bible says without holiness you won't see God. And you're not holy if you're living in sin. And, and so uh, people got their own pet peeve sins that they don't want anybody talking about. Homosexual? You're a wicked person. You're doing unrighteousness. And you don't need to be comfortable sitting in church somewhere. Fornicator? Adulterer? You're unrighteous. You're on your way to hell. That's not me telling you. The word of God says it. And if that's the case, it's my job to warn you. So let this be your notice. If, if you've never heard a message from this, from this pulpit or have never heard that before, if you are living in adultery, if you're a fornicator or if you're a liar, or if you're an unbeliever, or if you're an extortioner, you are on your way to hell. And there's no way around it unless you repent of it. No way. In fact, let's go look at that real quick. Let's go to the book of uh, 1 Corinthians. The, um, let me see, I think it's the fifth chapter. We're going to start reading at verse 9. The fifth chapter of the book of First Corinthians. It says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. In other words, don't keep company with them. 
That includes your relatives. That includes your family reunions. That includes weddings. And anything else you could think of that the devil done put in your heart to bring family closer together. If they fornicators, you ain't supposed to keep company with them. Go ahead and keep reading. Yet not all together with fornicators of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then ye must needs go out of the world. In other words, I'm not just talking about folks that's in the world. That's, that's very clear. He says, verse 11, But now I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother. Notice he didn't say that is a brother. He says you're calling him one. That means he's in church. That means that he's got religion. In other words, religion, going to church, don't excuse your behavior. You're in the same shape that somebody is that's out in the world. So that goes for you homosexuals that that's done found your way and that have gotten comfortable in church. Just because your pastor accepts you don't mean that God does. You're in the same shape as somebody that's out in the world being a homosexual. You singing in the choir does not excuse your sin. It says, but now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator. Now every time you see fornicator, that covers the homosexual as well. They'll always be fornicators. God will never recognize, I don't care what this country recognizes, God will never recognize marriage between a man and a man or a woman and a woman. He will never recognize that. If God judged the whole city, a city whose name came from the very acts that you commit. God set it up that way. What is sodomy? <clears throat> We've explained that before in a message. Sodomy is sexual acts that cannot produce a child. And you know ain't no man and a man coming together producing a child. No two females going to produce a child together either. So anything y'all do in bed is considered sodomy. What is the root word of sodomy? Sodom. The city that God destroyed for their sexual sins. So God does not recognize homosexual marriage. Does not recognize it. And therefore, you will always be a fornicator. It doesn't matter what Supreme Court have passed it and made it legal. You will always be a fornicator. You need to repent. You don't need to try to find ways to get around it in God's word if you call yourself going to church. That's something you need to repent of. Doesn't matter if your pastor know about it. Doesn't matter if they've married you. Doesn't matter if you found a church where, quote unquote, all are welcome. You need to repent. That is sin, and you are on your way to hell if you don't repent. You could say, I'm judging, but it's in God's word. Now, here's the thing. Do you, I'm talking to you homosexuals that are in church. Not the folks that are out in the world, they need to get saved. That's, that's homosexuals. They need to get saved. They need the gospel preached to them to be saved. I'm talking to you folks that think you're saved. You see that? Doesn't matter how long you've been going to church. Just because your pastor have accepted it doesn't mean that God does. And, and you need to repent of it. It's, you will not go to heaven doing that. Let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 11 says, But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous, that's talking about folks that's wanting other people's possessions or are greedy for other people's possessions or an idolater. That's somebody that's just got to always have things. Don't know how to control, you know, if somebody has a problem with shopping, it, that, it's because they're an idolater. They have idols in their lives. They worship things. They, and they'll put things above their own souls. 
<clears throat> those people that are willing to go into debt behind shopping, behind buying things, behind having things, that's an idolater. Those people that's got to work two and three jobs to make ends meet, nine times out of ten, you're an idolater. You, you're trying to maintain a lifestyle, maintain a lifestyle that's not meant for you. You're trying to live outside of your means, working two and three jobs and can't even, can't even enjoy those things that you have because you're working all the time. You're an idolater. You will not go to heaven unless you repent. Let's go ahead and keep reading. Or a railer or a drunkard. Folks that like to get buzzed and drunk, you on your way to hell. Don't, don't tell me, well, you know, Noah was a drunkard. And if he died a drunkard, he's in hell today. Let me make this clear. Just because God uses you, don't make you right. When God called, Moses, uh, called Noah, he wasn't drinking. The Bible says that Noah was a righteous man. We don't read about him drinking until after the flood. You see that? God's word is the same throughout eternity. He don't switch it up for people. Let's go ahead and keep reading. Or an extortioner. What is an extortioner? Somebody that gives, gets things through dishonest means. The, your pastor that's standing in the pulpit preaching that you have to tithe. That, that's, your, that, that's your church extortioner there. Let's go and keep reading. With such an one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without God judges. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Now let's go to chapter 6 and start reading at verse 9. says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? So we've established homosexuality, unrighteous. Adultery, unrighteous. Fornicators, unrighteous. Lies, any sin that you can think of is unrighteous. And look at what he says. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? So if you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God, then what are you going to inherit? Hell is going to be your portion. It says, be not deceived. If, when God tells you to be not deceived, that means that there are deceivers that's operating in this area. He's telling you to watch out for the great deception. Don't be deceived by it. Don't think that you're going to live in sin and still go to heaven. Impossible. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. So he's telling you, people, it's impossible for you to go to heaven doing these things and if that's the case you need to repent if you want to go there so don't send me an email telling me that I'm judging God's word have already set the judgment it's in our laws that a thief can go to jail for so many days so many years or so many months or whatever that's in the law so it's silly for you to go steal something and get caught and then stand before a judge and tell a judge, don't judge me. You've judged yourself through your own wickedness. When you did it, you had already set judgment against yourself. And the only way to come out of that judgment is to repent and turn away from it. Amen. We want to say thank you all for joining us today. We pray that something has been said that has been a blessing to you. And we pray that you will continue to listen in to this broadcast. Have a blessed day.